Hi, it's Sarah with House Copper. Today I'm going to, at the request of some of you, do a quick tour of the different tinning stakes that I have. I will follow up with either some photos or um, some snaps of vintage renderings of stakes that I don't have yet that I use at Bob's or uh, you may find when you're out tool hunting and you'll know what they are once you see them. And I'll kind of give an explanation when I show the images of what they are used for. But I'm gonna do a quick one of what I have here and I'm gonna say two things about these um, stakes. First and foremost, they are used interchangeably for tin and copper sheet work. Um, so that's what they're made for. Some actually are um, for more copper work, but we, Bob and I use them interchangeably. I use them interchangeably. Um, you can use them for steel sheet metal if you're gonna do any stainless sheet metal work. Um, but the one thing it's not meant for, none of these tools are, are hardened by, um, by means of uh, work hardening or, or heating so that they're able to withstand the use of working with wrought iron. So if you're going to be doing any blacksmithing, if you use these tools, you will pit them and make them not usable for future copper or tinsmiths who might get their hands on them because they'll be so pitted that it'll mark their work. So um, these are soft metal tools. Uh, bear that in mind. If you're a blacksmith, please don't use these. Go get blacksmith tools. So without further ado, let's uh, go through the tour. All right, no judgment, please, on my messy um, tinsmithing bench. Um, but first, what you can see here, this is a steak plate, and it's set inside of a table. It was always set flush to the, the table, and a tinner's bench usually had two of these um, on opposite sides of the bench, so you could have at least two tinsmiths working at the same time, and then you would store your tools underneath. Um, but this is just, it's a, a standard steak plate. Um, you pretty much don't need to like keep all the brand names together. They work um, interchangeably for the most part. There's so many different holes and sizes that you can play around with that. Um, okay, so the first one in front of us is just, it's a square steak. Um, and I'm gonna try and, you know, go around so you can see it. So it's, that's what it's called, it's called a square steak. Remember how everybody was super inventive with names? Um, this one right here is pretty lightweight. It's actually pretty small. This one's called a needle case steak, um, probably because it was used the smaller end for making needle cases because needles were precious and they wanted to keep them nearby and without getting wrecked or lost. So they had those special cases. This one is, um, here, hold on. No, nope, I'm not gonna get it in there. That one's a hatchet because it looks like a hatchet. Um, this one, if you can see, is usually straight on one side and curved um, at an angle on the other. That's for helping you get your seams ready um, or working corners. Over here, you've seen me work on this. This is a bee corn, otherwise known as a tinner's anvil. Again, not made for blacksmiths. Please don't use it or you'll pocket. Look how soft this metal is. Um, all right. I'm gonna go over here on the wall. We're gonna, there's another uh, needle case up there. This is a creasing steak. So it's reminiscent of the swedges that you would find if you went even further back into the 1700s, which had like a sliding um, extra hammer that would come across here. And then the hammer would be uh, able to work within these grooves depending on your adjustments and you would make a crease. This is without the hammer, but it's the same concept. So it's different sized um, uh, uh, wedges, I guess, for, for reading your metal to take a wire and then they invented the wiring machine. All right. I don't know why this one is called the conductor stake, but it is. Um, uh, uh, Bob and I use it a lot of times to prepare uh, burrs if the burring machine didn't do its job. Um, both of the ends are slightly at an angle, if you can see that. They're very slight, but that's something to be cognizant of if you're using it. You can't really hold something like uh, completely perpendicular. I am so not prepared to do this whole thing. This one's called a blow horn. If you um, can see, it is uh, the shape of a cone up top, great for, sorry, my husband called me um, 
in the middle of me filming this, so I had to blur out. Okay, um, so that one is bullhorn. There you go for doing cone work. Down here is a really relatively large one again, um, and I'm gonna try and zoom out. You can see um, the ends are actually pretty much similar. They uh, this is called a double bottoming stake. Um, Bob uses it a lot. Some of them will not be round all the way through. Some of them will actually be flat right here. So where the stake comes down and it would go into the stake plate, this is uh, flat. Um, so they, they do come in different um, designs. Mine are kind of rusty, I need to polish them. Sorry, excuse my rust. Um, okay, not to make you dizzy, over here. Is a round stake. <laughs> that's all that's called. There's another square stake that clearly needs to be polished. Um, and that's about all I have. So now I'm going, um, oh, actually, this one. I didn't show you this one yet. I knew there was one. This one right here, if you'll notice, it's very similar to the needle case stake, but it is much longer and it is much wider. And this is called the candle stake for making um, candle molds. Um, tin Smiths would be in charge of making the tin molds that would create candles for lighting back in the day and everybody had them so they made a lot of them. All right, I'm going to show you um, drawings and talk over them for the, the items I don't have like the hollow mandrel and a couple other more specialty stakes that you will want to definitely find if you're going to take up this trade and start collecting. Um, all right. Actually, I uh, am not going to show you as many drawings. Now that I went to Bob's, I decided to do um, a quick video at his shop of the handful of stakes that he has that I didn't have. And then I will do two quick pictures, maybe three, of stakes that are really rare that neither Bob nor I have. But here we go. Um, just a quick overview of a few more uh, slightly rarer stakes. And... Um, Hopefully that'll help you out. All right, here we go. First, we have a small bottoming stake. Then over here is a side stake. And uh, if it's a different shape, it can, like a cone, it's a funnel stake. This one is a coppersmith square stake. Notice it's round on this end versus just the square bottoming stake over there. That's the difference and a great way to tell. Then over here, he's got two different sizes of these, but they're pipe stakes, clearly named that way. You need me now? And I think there was one more, yeah. The extinguisher steak. Um, this one has a hole in it, but the shape is appropriate for that particular steak, so extinguisher steak. And then down here, he's got a bajillion mounts, of which I'm jealous, which are for your machines, for uh, mounting on your, your benches. So there you go. So, there you go. I'm going to quickly show you some photos now. Um, the first one, is going to be um, of several different stakes that you can put inside this holder. I've never seen one of these. They apparently exist. Um, if you can find one with, with the holder and all of those different stakes, you are in luck. And I have no idea how stable they are because I cannot speak to that. Then the other one that I'm going to show you a picture of has a few more bizarre stakes. The top left, that hollow mandrel stake, number one. Bob has a few of those. I do not have any of those. And, uh, and then there's a couple more specialty ones, especially that third one where you can exchange the different heads. And, um, and also that, that tea kettle steak, which is quite large and really helpful if you are making tea kettles, which were prolific in um, the 17 and early 1800s. All right, so there you have it. The tea kettles, um, you know, I might do a separate thing on tea kettles because they're so fascinating, but I don't make a lot of them. They're really hard to make. They're very, they were very distinguished back then, just like they would be today. There's, um, you know, clearly specific stakes just for making them. If you have any questions, comments, if you have stakes that I didn't show, I would love to hear about them. Um, if, if you have questions about how any of the stakes are used, 
Um, I can do some demonstrations on those. I will let you know that Bob and I have decided that 2019 is the year we will make an extensive video on how to create um, uh, um, cramp seam uh, traditional fur trade copper kettles. Nobody that we know of is making them. They would have the, the cramp seams and the heavy wire um, and the brazed um, the brazed fillings. So um, of, of brass for um, the cramp seam. So we're gonna we're gonna try and do it. Um, we have an authentic pattern, and it's going to be very hard and scary, but just a, a sneak peek for something to look forward to next year. Anyway, thanks for watching. Hope this was helpful, and talk to you later.